welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where we are reading the book entitled Dwelling in the Secret Place by Sonica Veith. This is an ebook available online for free at clashofminds.com where you can download it and read along with us. Sonica Veith is the spouse of well-known evangelist, lecturer, university professor, and zoologist, Dr. Walter Veith. And this true story is a chronicle of their life together, their ministry, their numerous trials, tribulations, and hardships, as well as their successes, victories, and triumphs. In our last reading, we covered chapter 1, entitled Little Fish Out of Water, where Sonica introduces us to her life as a child growing up in the Natal province in Durban, South Africa. Her parents were well educated and were friendly and respectable in the community. Her mother was a teacher and lecturer in the university, and her dad was a newspaper journalist who had developed a practice of investigating spiritualistic and supernatural events. This became his main focus, and he became quite involved in the spirit world. Her mom seemed basically indifferent to the strange events and happenings that he was involved in, despite the rattling of her deceased father's canes all by themselves, and the strange breathing sound of some unknown person sitting in the lounge chair and breathing deeply. Her brother and Sonica thought of that as Grandpa coming to visit. Sonica always felt like a fish out of water. She was the only little girl in her school who didn't go to church, and she had only two friends. The first was Ivan, a few years older than her, who lived down the street, and whose mom, had more husbands and children than you could imagine, and who would sometimes drop off Ivan at their house and not return for a week or so, or put him out in the cold and he would run up to their home and ask if he could sleep there. Her other friend, Katie, was also another fish out of water, whose dad was usually away for long periods of time working in the mines while his wife and her older sisters seemed to be making money of their own entertaining men. At such times, Katie would either be locked in her room or put out to play. Sonica's brother was five years older than her and as a result of a polio vaccine had contracted that disease, ending up with one leg thin and skinny with a club foot. Kids made fun of him at school. Although he didn't show it to his parents, he was bitter and frustrated with low self-esteem, and he took it out on Sonica when they were home alone, which was most of the time. Rather than stay at home with him, Sonica would take to walk in the streets. One time, she decided she wanted to go into a church, and in her wanderings, she tried every church in the community, only to find them all locked, which made her wonder if their God was any good at all, since he was always locked up in the churches. But after many attempts, she finally found the church that was open, but there was no one inside. She spent a long time in there, sitting in the pews and singing songs to herself and then making up her own songs when she ran out of the ones that she knew. She had found a place of peace and freedom, at least for the time being, anyhow. Remember, friends, you can download this book for free from clashofminds.com and read along with us as we begin Chapter 2 today, entitled Island Friendship. Hurry! We have to drive a long way to fetch your brother and his friend, my mother called as she started the car. My brother had come up to Natal 
from his university in the Cape province where he was studying with his German roommate to spend the holidays with us. Just before they started climbing the long hill to Richmond, his faithful student car, Ilse, threw in the towel and a few nuts and bolts as well. She refused to go an inch further and had to be towed to the scrap heap. The two were standing beside the road as we pulled into the small town. They looked scruffy and tired, as students often do. I was curious about my brother's new friend, but hardly had the courage to look. For a brief moment, I wondered what he would think of me in my cheap, crimply dress that I had made myself, our old car, and a community chest building scheme house in a backstreet area of the bluff. We had no carpets on the cold vinyl floors, nor any curtains in the living area, simply because there was no money for it. Not to mention my father leaving his well-paid job to print his mystical books in the garage, or the taxman breathing down his neck for not paying tax for the past couple of years, which cost me all my accumulated savings to help keep my dad out of jail. The car was droning on monotonously from Richmond back to Durban. I managed to steal a few distrusting but inquisitive glimpses of this self-confident, boisterous young German student. He wore white stovepipe jeans and a red t-shirt with big holes in the front, which he explained got caught in a windmill. His blonde hair was almost down to his shoulders, and his blue eyes were constantly challenging those around him. He was always teasing and joking, often pulling hideous faces and making weird sounds. I thought he was a bit crazy, but he was different and fun to be with. I was quieter than usual on the way back, struggling to hold back the tears as we traveled the same road on which my childhood friend Ivan was killed a few months earlier. He had moved to Natal to study at the university in Pietermaritzburg and phoned to say that he was on his way to visit me. I waited all day, but no sign of him. Towards evening, there was a knock at the door, and a young fellow student of his told us, that the beach buggy Ivan and his friends had been traveling in overturned on one of the notorious natal corners, killing Ivan instantly. After the young man had left, I sat down in silence at my piano and composed a song for Ivan, hoping that he was listening on the other side. But I found no comfort and longed to find a place where I could once again pour out my soul to the unseen, unknown God I had found in the little chapel as a young child. One of the girls in my class at that time was the daughter of a Dutch Reformed minister. They lived about 10 kilometers from us in the parsonage adjacent to the large church of a well-off parish. One Sunday morning, I decided to visit her and join her for the church service. I got out of bed quietly so as not to awake anyone, got dressed in my best clothes and started walking toward the church in my shiny new heeled shoes and Sunday hat. It was a hot and humid morning and my feet started to chafe, but I continued until I reached the front door of my friend's house. The minister opened the door and looked at me in surprise. Hello? Who are you? He asked with an impatient tone of voice. Hello, I have come to visit Renee, I stammered. No, sorry, you can't see her now, was his brief answer, and he closed the door. At the church service, Renee was not allowed to sit with me. Neither was I allowed to sit with her and her family. And I found myself in a place where I could hide behind a large man in the back of the church until the service was over. 
During the last hymn, I slipped out and started the two-hour walk back home. No one greeted me, nor asked me where I came from, or even asked me if they could give me a ride back home. And I felt sad that I had found no comfort there. When I eventually got home, bathed in sweat and with blisters on my feet, my parents looked at me as if I had lost my mind. But no one said a word, and despondently, I hid myself in my room. I continued my quest for solace for many a Sunday, and eventually, I was allowed short five-minute visits with the minister's daughter, as long as I didn't sit on her bed for some unexplained reason. However, I was never accepted because of my heathen background. And eventually, I stopped my search for God altogether. Are you listening? What? Yes, I'm listening. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Then repeat what we said. My brother's friend was irritating me. And I felt like spinning my cocoon and shutting myself away from everyone. But his eyes were challenging me, rudely drawing me away from my memories. That night, I went to bed wondering what had brought him across my path. About a year later, my brother and his German friend Walter planned to drive up to Mozambique and spend their winter holidays on the tropical island Magaruke. My brother brought his girlfriend along, and since Walter was alone, there was space in the car for little sister. Although I wasn't so little anymore, I was in my final year at school and had just turned 17. The trip up north was interesting to say the least. The roads were bad, the people were hostile, and there were guerrilla fighters and army trucks everywhere. We lost our exhaust along the road, and I wondered if we would make it in Walter's little Renault. At last, we arrived in Lorenzo Marquez, later known as Maputo, where life didn't seem to be affected much by the war, apart from tanks passing through the city from time to time. The nightclubs and streets were alive and people were enjoying the famous Mozambican food out on the sidewalks. Our first trip was a boat ride to the island in Haka. It was a gray and blustery day, and the ocean was restless with intimidating swells all around the small boat. We had only covered a short distance of the more than 30 kilometers from the mainland to the island when the waves started crashing into the boat. By now, Walter was no longer sitting. His body was limply drooped over the side of the boat like a rag doll, feeding the fish all the way until we arrived at the island. There was no harbor and no dock, but instead, the locals ran into the waves and hauled us onto the beach. The wind had subsided and the sun was peeping through the clouds. But Walter was still decidedly green around the gills and lay down under a palm tree. The island beaches were soft and white and beautifully decorated with coconut trees and interesting mangroves. The little town had only a few residents and tourists with shops scattered around among the evergreen trees. Beautiful coral reefs and fish glimmered under the water but we had no time to spend there. We had to return to take the boat to our final destination. Back on the mainland, we brought some bread and a few necessities and set off for the boat that would take us to the island Magaruke. This island was wild and unpopulated. There were no buildings or shops, no huts, no drinking water and only one dilapidated toilet at the beach. We disembarked with our drums of water, tents, food, and clothing to last us 
until the boat would return in one week's time. To the right, we found a spot among some trees where we pitched our tent and had some privacy from the couple of other campers a little further down the beach. It was June, but the winter sun was warm and relaxing. There was hardly a ripple on the unpolluted turquoise water, save for a gentle swishing as little waves spilled shells and other undiscovered gems onto the white sands. I watched Walter, now recovered from his nausea spell, doing everything at high speed, but efficiently, ever joking and making fun of someone, but at the same time, letting no one get too close. That night, the other two were asleep already, when Walter and I were still sitting on the beach, watching the tide come in. The moon had drawn a quivering silver line on the surface of the ocean, and only the swishing sound of little waves breaking on the shore filled the ear. Are you tired? he suddenly asked, without looking at me. No, I answered tentatively. Well, no wonder. You're always sleeping in the car. We'll have to tie you to the roof rack every time you fall asleep. He chuckled softly. There were a few moments of silence as he brushed the sand off his clothes. You know, people are like stones, he suddenly said in a serious tone. Huh? I wasn't sure what he was trying to say, but noticed a little crack in his armor. He had left a small opening in the door of his soul for me to peep through. And the rest of that moonlight night, a friendship developed that was to last forever. Above us, some nocturnal bird was screeching. The cool night breeze made me shiver, and I crept into my sleeping bag as Walter started telling me his story. Just before the Second World War, his father, who was a confectioner, had come from Germany to South Africa to try and earn money to sustain his struggling family in Germany. He was a young Catholic who was going to be a priest, but he met Walter's mother, who was a faithful Lutheran, also of German descent. He nevertheless decided to marry her, even though it was frowned upon in those days. They managed to arrange a double wedding, since his mother was one of twins. First, they married in the Catholic Church, and straight after that, in the Lutheran Church, together with her twin sister. Because of the war, Walter's father was interned in a South African concentration camp for almost ten years, which resulted in Walter being ten years younger than his only sister who emigrated first to Australia and then to the United States of America when she was 18. Walter was sent to a predominantly Lutheran German school in Cape Town where, being raised as a Catholic, he had separate religious instruction with a nun from the local convent. At the age of eight years, he learned that his mother had cancer. This nun would visit Walter's mother while she was bedridden. But instead of offering to help the struggling family, she persistently tried to persuade his mother to become Catholic. This was in the time before the Vatican II decision that people may remain in their respective denominations, provided they acknowledge the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. It's such a shame that your mother will have to go to hell forever the nun said in religious instruction class one day. By this time, the little boy had started resenting the nun and hated the God she represented for being so cruel to the mother he loved so much. He became so rebellious that he tore up the catechism book and tossed it at the stern-faced nun and was consequently expelled from that class indefinitely. Occasionally the headmaster would do his rounds and find the defiant little boy sitting outside the class at which he would inquire what the reason was. 
the old cow threw me out, was the only answer he received. And the inevitable result was a good thrashing in the headmaster's office. This continued for years, while his mother hung on to life, knowing that her young son still needed her. Radiation was still in the experimental stage, and often they would leave her too long in the radiation room, and she would be burnt to a crisp. At night, her screams of pain would cut through bone and marrow, and the young boy felt helpless and angry, lying in his bed alone at night, wondering what kind of God would let his mother suffer so much. But he never spoke about his problems to anyone. At home, his father, who worked day and night to feed his family, had little patience with anyone, especially a boy who seemed to be difficult at school. At times, he would lash out at him and hit his son in the face. And when his bleeding nose stained the wooden floor, he gave him another good thrashing and made him scrub it all clean. As time went by, and his mother was virtually at the brink of death, another visit from the nun resulted in his pale and weakened mother bursting into tears. For the first time, Walter's father heard what the nun had said, and too late he realized what had been going on. The big German, with his even bigger German temperament, took hold of the nun by the back of her long black dress and physically walked her to the door, forbidding her to ever set foot in his house again. But the damage was done. At school, the other staff members were biased against the rebellious and defiant child. One teacher would strike him in the face every day before he even started his class. Another subtracted marks from the subject to punish him for bad behavior in another class. And so it went on until his mother died when he was 12. He failed that year at school and his hatred for schools and teachers and God grew daily. To make things worse, Walter's father remarried very soon after the death of his wife. One night, as in the story of Hansel and Gretel, he tiptoed down the dark passage and overheard his stepmother say, I refuse to live with that boy in the house. He will have to go. He was subsequently placed in the dormitory of the German school where he ran away a couple of times into the forest. When the teachers came looking for him, he climbed up into a pine tree where he was out of their reach and bombarded them with pine cones from above. He hated school so much that he fabricated his own bomb and blew up a huge tree on some school grounds. The explosion was so powerful that the whole tree took off, glided through the air and landed on the rugby field. On another occasion, he catapulted rocks onto the roof of a school building using poplar trees, a sling, and a homemade pulley system, and then unobtrusively joined the crowd that had gathered to see what had happened. It wasn't long after this that his stepmother convinced his father that the boy was useless and needed to leave school to learn a trade of some sorts. But his defiant nature resisted their decision, and he refused to leave school. Fortunately, his uncle was inspector of schools at that time, and managed to get him into one of the prestigious boys' schools, where, as was to be expected, the next disaster was awaiting him. The school was predominantly Jewish, and he was German, but he knew he was there on probation and was determined to try his best to stay out of trouble and finish school. But his cocky attitude seemed to attract trouble like an insect to the sticky tendrils of a Venus flytrap. 
one of the Jewish boys took a disliking to Walter and started ramming into him whenever he saw him, provoking him and swearing at him for being a German Hitler. Then one day, after the boy had rammed Walter with his shoulder again, something snapped in him and he grabbed the Jewish boy, dragged him into the classroom, stuck his head into the desk and slammed the lid down on his face. Blood was streaming from his nose and both were summoned into the headmaster's office. It's over. I'm dead, Walter thought to himself as he awaited the verdict of the headmaster after they reported what had happened. The headmaster told the Jewish boy to wait outside and Walter was bracing himself for the worst. But the headmaster calmly said, I cannot condone what you did and I will have to do some fancy footwork when that boy's parents hear about this. But I do believe that you have been punished enough already. And for the sake of peace, we will have to pretend to go through the motions. He picked up his cane that had an honorary place in the bookcase and struck the back of his armchair several times. He pulled straight his jacket and went to the door to call the Jewish boy in. Now, if your face wasn't so messed up, I would also give you the thrashing of your life. If you ever provoke this young man again, you will be expelled. Is that clear? And with a twinkle in his eye, he sent them back to class. The rest of Walter's life at the new school was uneventful and he regained some degree of respect for his teachers and schools. When he finished school at the end of 1967, he had to serve in the army for a year, after which he decided to go to university. But his father was forbidden by his stepmother to pay for his studies, even though he had the money. His stepmother started to reveal more and more of the selfish reasons why she married his father. Through hard work, his father had become a wealthy man and she was intent on inheriting as much of it as possible. Walter went to work on the railways and restaurants every weekend and holidays to pay for his university education. He enrolled at Stellenbosch University and ended up sharing a room in the dormitory with my brother. Are you tired now? The sun was just rising on the watery horizon, spreading a spectacular splash of colors across the sky. Yes, and there's no roof rack to tie me to. I yawned and fell asleep on the cool sand to the sound of the island birds chirping in the trees. After a few days, we had eaten our last bread, so we went spearfishing just a few meters offshore. Masses of exotic tropical fish and schools like silver moonbeams casually drifted by. Groupers, bigger than the size of grown men, inquisitively brushed against us as we respectfully tried to steer clear of their huge mouths, big enough to swallow a man. On the beach, we made a fire and cooked the few fish my brother and Walter had caught. We were worried. There were still a few days left before the boat would return, and we were hungry. We had nothing left to eat but some peri-peri and rice. That evening, when the moon came out, we decided to harvest some of the thousands of giant crabs that surfaced from their holes in the sand at night, scurrying across the shimmering beaches. In a short while, we were heading back to the tent, our pillowcases filled with our clawing, scratching meal. The next day, we spent hours cleaning the crabs, and my brother's girlfriend prepared them with the last rice and peri-peri we had. She obviously never cooked with anything as spicy and hot as that before. And needless to say, we ended up just as hungry as before and our crab meal became fish food. A few days later, 
and a few kilograms lighter, we watched with a sigh of relief as the boat from the mainland pulled ashore. The end of chapter 2 of Dwelling in the Secret Place by Sonica Vyth.